I think it's um, welcome, all of you. I would like to give all of you a hand. I think it's almost possible. But uh, in the sake of time, uh, let's uh, start this session on complex rocks. And to begin with, I have a couple of uh, uh, introductory slides, just a few to bring you up to speed in what's happened in the past, and then we talk about uh, the future. Non-biological complex drugs, recent developers and impact on cl clinical practice, that's the title. And we have a number of presentations, and can I have the, um, that concern this, this concept of, of complex drugs. And it started a um, number of years ago um, in, in Leiden, when at, the time, at that time I was director of the Top Institute Pharma in the Netherlands, and we had a workshop on the therapeutic equivalence of complex drugs. At that time, that was sort of new. And we had input from industry, from academia, from regulatory, the regulatory side. And um, this paper was drafted and published as sort of the beginning of this discussion on complex drugs. Um, and that was followed up by uh, publications in other um, journals, publications on the basis usually of uh, uh, conferences, conference reports. Um, this one is the similarity question for biologicals and non-biological complex drugs. So here you see the sort of split between complex biological drugs and complex non-biological drugs. And that was published uh, two years ago as a result of a meeting in, I think, in Budapest. Um, it went on. We had a meeting, very successful meeting, in uh, uh, last year in New York um, at the New York Academy of Sciences, and that resulted in another paper, a white paper. Um, here again, it's interesting to see that um, for the first time in the publication, we had, um, um, well, not um, representatives, but people working at for WHO, for FDA, and for EMA, who sort of were part of the discussion and uh, were on the, on the paper, on this white paper. Well, having said that, um, it's time to move on to the program of today. We see that uh, we have one, two, three, four, five uh, presentations. But um, uh, Wenlei Jiang from FDA is unfortunately not able to uh, join us. So um, we have a little bit more time. So that's also the reason why I thought it's OK to spend some time as an introduction on the idea of complex and non-biological complex drugs. With that. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, uh, ask Stefan Mullenbach to the floor. Uh, he will talk about uh, recent developments with non-biological complex drugs, complex drugs in a complex environment. Um, Stefan uh, has a number of uh, positions. Um, one is at the University of Basel, professor at the University of Basel, and the other is at FIFO in Zurich. Stefan, please take the floor. Yeah. What I forgot to say is that at the end, uh, there is a question and debate opportunity. We'll see how that works out. But uh, in, in principle, uh, we have time for uh, closer interaction. OK, Stefan, please take the floor. Thank you, Dan, for this early morning introduction. So I think with uh, this device, I can handle uh, the pointer is here as well, yeah, yeah, I realized. So having the chance to stay a little bit ahead, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, recent development with non-biological complex products, complex drugs in a complex environment. Choosing the title, uh, I try to give you some insight on the topic, how it evolved over the last couple of years and where we stand or where we have the debate today. If we look on the landscape of complex drugs, uh, we try to put together an overview slide in showing the aspect why these complex drugs are complicated. 
we were taking two aspects to look at. The one was the pharmaceutical equivalence and the bioequivalence. And if you can show for a drug and the follow-on version that they are uh, identical or similar enough, then you come to a therapeutic equivalence, meaning that substitution and interchange can be addressed. We had quite a series of good examples where especially the generic uh, uh, paradigm was very successful in providing a lot of uh, therapeutic equivalent drugs which could be used in practice. These are relatively simple aspects to consider as the small molecules normally are uh, to be fully described and characterized by physicochemical means. There are a few products which have uh, higher requests regarding the bioequivalence, like for example the narrow therapeutic index drugs, the topical products at finally inhalers, but nevertheless the pharmaceutical equivalence is still relatively good to show. The story uh, turned into much higher complexity when we were going to the large molecular products, for example, the biologics, where demonstration of uh, pharmaceutical equivalence is much more demanding. And uh, that was the reason why, as well, the regulator introduced a separate procedure, well known worldwide as the biosimilar approach. But we have other products depicted here, which are as important and showing complexity in a comparable or sometimes even more demanding uh, manner. For example, uh, the liposomes depicted here, or polymeric micelles. Then we have drugs like the albumin-bound nanoparticles, Abraxan as an example. We have swelling polyvers. We have the low molecular weight heparin, which is depicted here in blue and green, meaning it is depending where you are on the side of the Atlantic in Europe, it's looked more as a biological, whereas US look more as a chemical. So depending on that, there are different rules how to deal with. And finally, we have the quite classical non-biological uh, complex drugs like the glatyramoid, like the iron, carbohydrate complexes like swelling polymers and finally as well ocular emulsion with a specific complexity uh, due to the composition and the characterization. Again, not easy to show full uh, bioequivalence and uh, pharmaceutical equivalence. Shortly to go into what is finally an NBCD or non-biological complex drugs uh, from the group and in the lead of Dan and Jan de Flieger, uh, this book, The Non-Biological Complex Drugs, The Science and Regulatory Landscape, was issued and you will find therein a lot of contributions to the whole topic, which is for those who are a little bit more and in depth interested certainly uh, of value to have a look in it. These are uh, aspects to know when talking about NBCDs, meaning that we have uh, high molecular products. They are uh, composed of a multitude of closely related, um, not homologous uh, asp uh, components, often of nanoparticular uh, characteristics. What is important to know is that the whole uh, complex is the active pharmaceutical ingredients, clearly telling that there is some um, important aspects to discuss more in details when it comes to these terms. They show variable immunogenicity, and uh, a very important aspect to consider is that by physicochemical means, you are not able to fully characterize this kind of drug. Therefore, the manufacturing process, 
which is important to give the profile in vivo and in vitro is of highest importance. When we go through this manufacturing process, uh, just quickly, uh, we have the physical chemical characterization which is in use by that, but nevertheless, as we have no full picture about it, we don't know which and what kind of probably clinical, uh, clinical meaningful differences could occur in between a reference product and uh, the follow-on version. These uh, stability aspects are induced and dependent on these physical chemical characteristics. So in handling this drug, this is important. On the other hand, we have all the aspects which then are of highest importance when it comes to the interaction in between the drug and the uh, biosystem in vivo, either preclinical or clinically. And then the PK and PD is defined by these processes where, as I said before, if there are differences in between the composition, even clinical, clinically meaningful differences will occur. Critical attributes, that is the question to find. And these critical attributes are important, finally, to show the therapeutic equivalence, the major uh, uh, intention to do these follow-on versions to get these products available for a larger group of patients and at uh, normally reasonable lower prices. When we look a little bit on the historical side, when these kind of NBCDs were brought into the market, then we can see it's in a way an old story too. So the first nanocolloidal products, the iron carbohydrates, were introduced here in Switzerland as uh, by the 1950. In the US, they were introduced in the 90s. And since then, quite <coughs> different products have been produced. We have the liposomes, we have the glatyramoids, we have nanocrystals, here shown by a a drug which is used in uh, uh, people with schizophrenia. A lot of these products are under development in the pipeline and uh, not only the one who are originators but as well uh, follow-on versions. And there the challenge is how to evaluate them and finally conclude how much or how well similar they are and could eventually be used uh, as substitutes. When we look into in vivo differences, and they were observed even after market authorization of these products, then there are on the one hand side non-clinical uh, differences, like the PK in animals, and shown here by this picture, where you can see that depending on the size and the coating of these uh, uh, particles, the uptake in the reticular endothelium system is different. A typical feature of these products which interact with the innate immune system up an exposure of an organism. But we had even other uh, important findings afterwards showing that in clinics these follow-on versions didn't show the same efficacy and safety issues. Uh, and that was one of the examples when up in a switching from the originator to a follow-on version of iron sucrose, the target hemoglobin was rapidly changed. So when seeing that, uh, the regulators reacted. They were giving some draft guidance, like in the US on iron sucrose, and uh, proposing aspects how to evaluate in a better way these drugs. But again, as well, uh, Europe was uh, very active in doing that, and EMA just sorted a series of reflection papers dealing with NBCDs and related compounds. So, for example, a reflection paper on data requirement for intravenous iron-based nanocolloidal products, or a reflection paper 
on the data requirements for intravenous liposomal drugs or a joint reflection paper on the development of block polymer micelles. When then we are looking into that, and as Dan showed in the very beginning, it's almost eight years ago, we started this discussion in our working party in the Netherlands, which had the chance to assemble people and experts from different areas, from academia, from knowledgeable institute, uh, from uh, regulators to discuss the topic and try to find out what is the science behind and are there conclusions to be done. This organization, uh, non-for-profit, private-public partnership, was quite successful over the last couple of years due to the collaboration and the expertise assembled in this group. And uh, looking onto the mission of this group, which has as purpose finally to give some more important consensus or discussion base for this NBCD evaluation. It includes three different aspects. First, to map the issues, to engage the people in discussions in a neutral platform where you can meet the people and finally to create and induce policies. The whole aspect is driven by looking on patient safety, on better complex characterization which then as well has impact on PKE and PD and their performance and finally to try to go a step further in the harmonization and the global acceptance of evaluation tools for interchangeability and substitution of such NBCDs. As some example, what we were dealing in this group that uh, was important to know that we addressed here, comparable to the biologics, a similar approach in contrast to the sameness approach, which was one of the rules in dealing with generics. So both products, the complex biologics and the complex non-biologic products, have some similarities. They are, as I said before, large heterogeneous uh, products defined by the manufacturing process as they are not to be fully characterized by physicochemical means, uh, it is almost not possible to show or even to create identical copies. That was one of the issues which was started in the very beginning with the Leiden workshop. Another aspect we could introduce was a publication-based discussion like, for example, an open scientific exchange on debate uh, with EMEA on the topic of is the EU ready for non-biological complex? And there were some debate about that. And the good thing in this publication, we could discuss about it, the position of EMEA, but as well the letter to the editor. And the editor in this aspect is Dan, um, again, somebody who knows the story about that? Nevertheless, uh, it can by, be followed as this journal is online, open access, and have a look if you are interested into that. We had the other, just very recent publication, which is online, uh, on the equivalence of complex drugs, products, advances, and the challenges for current uh, regulatory framework addressed again by Dan in his initial slide and uh, that was a mean to provide a kind of common understanding and challenging and that was addressed in the following aspects. First, there are common understanding as we have seen before in the knowledgeable institute like WHO and the regulators FDA and EMA, that the critical attributes for these drugs have to be shown. It is important that the scientific findings have to be published and are 
open access for those who are interested in. And it is a necessity to create a consensus for nomenclature and label, labeling. And finally, the question about what to do if we have substandards of such products and how to deal with. Just shortly going through the actual uh, regulations in US and in Europe and on the question uh, how can substituted uh, product to be regulated and evaluated by uh, these uh, pathways. And uh, just uh, from a personal view as well, how they are dealing with looking into US, we have the generic approach, not a way to go, as this product have this nano uh, aspect, which is not taken up by the classical generic uh, approach, which goes for sameness. We have the 505B2, which is done for not identical products, but as we have seen before, there are even differences in the in vivo and clinical aspects. So again, highly difficult or impossible to be used for substitutable products. And the biosimilar approach is a difficult one as these products are not biologics. In Europe, almost the same generics, not the way to go. Article 10a, uh, difficult as you are only giving reference and we have seen it's important to look in these products as well in clinical and non-clinical aspects and the biosimilar approach as I told before. Taken together, follow-on version of uh, such drugs have established and well-used procedures like the generic approach. We have a defined aspects regarding biologicals, but about the non-biological complex, there is still a lot to do. We have to define the critical attributes and find them. We have to look how much they are clinically meaningful Finally, we have to discuss some terms if they still fully apply to these kind of products. And the pharmacovigilance is of highest importance as uh, uh, we have to look how they behave in uh, the use. This <coughs> not yet defined and harmonized process is under debate and uh, is something we hopefully can deal with success in the future. With that, thank you for listening to me and I hope that some questions could be raised afterward. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Stefan. Um, you clearly indicated uh, the topic, uh, what's already sort of uh, resolved, but also was in the debate and what still has to be done. And that is on both sides of the ocean thinking, we have to think. Um, but you also pointed out that it's the science and uh, nothing else that should really drive this process. Um, so in that sense, it's important to have these publications out all the time and with a certain uh, frequency. Are there any questions? Um, we will have at the end uh, some time for debate. Um, but if there are any burning questions, then to Stefan. Marissa, please. Um, okay. <laughs> yes, I have a really burning question because, uh, first of all, your um, presentation is very inspiring, very clear, so you cannot avoid questions. Do you think that the statement you made would be equally applicable to solve another problem which we have with the complex? non-biological drugs, which is the scale up of the production. Because I think one of the major bottlenecks whereby you have fantastic work in animal models, in early in human eventually, then you don't end up with a proper confirmatory trial. And uh, I was told that might be the difficulties in scale up. Do you think your approach will also cover, yes, the substitution, yes, the possibility to have copies, but um, is not maybe for the field of this uh, emerging uh, area of um, 
complex drugs, uh, the so-called nano, you don't think it's um, really necessary for scale up. And the yeah. second point is a statement. You forgot one guideline, which everyone forgets, everyone, another reflection paper, because it's not immediate, it's a little bit subtle. Because at the same time, when we published all that stuff, we published also a paper on coating. Right. People still think that nanotechnology is for drug delivery. Someone was trying to convince me yesterday that nano does not exist, it's only nano delivery systems would exist. Well, I would invite to read my paper, my Emma paper, on the coating, yeah. which is particularly relevant to understand that it's not just um, delivery. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa, for this question. I will just uh, enter into the second question. And I tried at least to show the, how important the coating is with the, the, the graph I showed, but it's no doubt about that is a relevant paper. I, I took a selection, probably I missed this one, but it is and has to be added. Thanks for this advice. I can amend even this, uh, this slide for that. Regarding the first question, we have seen and said and we have uh, uh, relevant evidence about that this manufacturing process is very critical and the scaling up even not knowing all the details we know it as well from our company which is uh, highly active in this field it is a comparable issue how to deal with and how to do that and you have to show and I think that is a little bit what we have seen as well from the biosimilar parts if you are just going for a scaling up, I think even as the originator, you have to show that this scaling up fulfills, for example, the biosimilars approaches, which is a topic to be dealt. But you are completely right, as the manufacturing process is so critical, we have to check if we have really uh, looked in all to the details and uh, finally be able to have consistent uh, let's say, batches of these drugs which show this aspect. Completely agree. Okay, thanks, Stefan. Um, before we continue, I just want to make one point. Um, in the beginning, I said that uh, Top Institute Pharma in the Netherlands was sort of the starting uh, initiator of this uh, MBCD story, or the complex drug story. Um, you saw on the slides that Stefan showed that there was a company called, it's not a company, it's a, a public-private partnership a management operation, uh, Ligature. And Ligature is the, follow, is the successor of Top Institute Pharma. So Top Institute Pharma is not dead. Ligature is the uh, operating um, body at the moment, Ligature. Uh, and with that, uh, I mean, Marissa already 